But you're the guy that says get lost, never bring me again. Yeah, basically. Sorry about that, mate. <laughs> I was the guy getting abuse on the phone, yeah. basically. Ego can be a massive thing that holds people back from a lot a lot of stuff they do. Um, I see a lot of young people that are trying to live a flash lifestyle yeah. when they should really be saving up to buy their first property. Yes. So stuff like that, that's probably ego driven. They want to yeah. look cool. They want to be that cool guy. They want to appear to be something that they're not. I've recently been diagnosed with ADHD. So in school, I really struggled. And I was in, in, in like the bottom sets on everything. I actually thought I was dumb. There's been some times throughout my journey where I've been so close to quitting. Mm -hmm. um, probably like two times I can remember where I've just thought, this is not for me. Luigi, young guy, 28 years old, doing well in property. Tell me, what's the portfolio value at the moment? So portfolio value is worth over 3.5 million. Wow. Um, obviously, that's not equity. That's just yeah. as a whole. If you add up all the values, all the value that's of what it's worth. Okay. Um, that's stretched over 14 properties. Very good. Um, currently buying five more. Okay. And then we're looking for other people as well to buy uh, yeah. more for. So, yeah. And what time frame have you been able to do that in? So I've been doing property investing for six years. Okay. So I started when I was around 22, um, 28 now. Yeah. So, yeah. Most people at 22 are not thinking about starting a property portfolio. So yeah. what was different in your thinking? I think for me, I was just hungry to get out of my situation I was in because yeah. I was working full time for at a call center, okay. um, selling insurance for people's sky equipment. Right. Um, so it wasn't the most fun job. But you're the guy that says, get lost, never bring me again. Yeah, basically. Sorry about that, mate. <laughs> I was the guy getting abuse on the phone, yeah. basically. But I used to kind of enjoy the job in a way because mm -hmm. I like the sales aspect. I like speaking with people. So I used to just show up motivated, trying to become number one on, on the leaderboard for that yeah. day. But at the same time, I was just broke. Like I was okay. always struggling to pay my bills. I was just scraping by. And then I just kind of said to myself, right, Luigi, you need to make something happen here. Mm. So I started to just try and really be frugal, save, save, save. Managed to um, save up around six thousand pounds. Very good. And then I like borrowed six thousand pounds from friends, family yeah. on like a ten percent interest rate. So I okay. pay them back their money plus ten percent. Right. Um, so I did that, and that allowed me to get my first property, which was a four bed. Well, it was a three bed. Turn it to a four bed. Um, I did no no renovation i just changed the dining room into a bedroom so i lived in it rented out the spare rooms okay but it was actually worth 150 right so i refinanced it for 150 i bought it for 125 and i was able to pull out about 18 grand from that use that towards so my because the value was higher you'd borrow borrowed effectively more money to get uh, uh, an extraction of some cash back out yeah exactly okay. and then it just kind of went from there really i just realized oh, okay this is cool i like being a landlord um so yeah and it just went from there but what what was the thing that encouraged you to to save because that's quite interesting when i speak to a lot of people in their 20s and i've got two of my kids in their 20s mm. my oldest is 30 um uh, you know generally people are not thinking about saving how can i save six grand in their 20s it's a case of you know how can yeah. i have a good time yeah 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 so i was also having a good time yeah <laughs> but i was just thinking right you know i know where i'm at I was being honest with where I'm at. I think mm -hmm. a lot of young people try and make the mistake of trying to act like some sort of baller when yes. they're not there yet. Yeah. So I was definitely living in my means. But yeah. it was like, you know, I was in a relationship at the time, couldn't even get my girlfriend takeaway right, some right. days. And it was just like, yeah. oh, I was just so broke. Yes. And like, I didn't, that didn't sit well with me. That kind of fired me up to think, right, I can't even order his food. So mm -hmm. it kind of like really pushed me. To think, I'm not, I'm not trying to be that guy. I really want to make something of myself. And then, yeah. Do you think younger people, and I want just a little bit older than yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot. When younger people today, do you think they're driven, hungry? Like sometimes you talk about people who, you know, had really rough, challenging background and it gets some focus, it gets a fire in their belly. Do you think you see a lot of that with uh, people in their 20s these days? Um, to be honest with you, I think it's just, comes down to people's personality mm -hmm. and their character um, in terms of are they entrepreneurial? Do they think outside the box? Or have they got more of an employee mindset where they just want to get a job, show yeah. up, show up, show up? Yeah. I don't even think it's an age thing. I just think it's okay. a character thing. 
yeah. and with the 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 entrepreneurial mindset yeah do you think that's something that evolves um uh, with their upbringing or do you think that's something just people are just born with you, you've got that gene or you haven't i think that parents can like nurture that side of you so for example if you're doing you know you're like selling things in school yeah something like that and then your mom might say oh well done you know that's going to kind of motivate you to do more yes whereas if you're going back home and your mom's like why are you doing that that's stupid just go and get a job yeah selling the paper round or something <clears throat> that's a different conversation so mm. i think it can be nurtured but i do think you've either got it or you don't in my opinion i think you've either got the business mindset yeah or you don't some people just don't have the business mind i think um but i guess you could learn it mm. you could learn it but it's going to take a lot of studying and yeah mindset work and stuff like that so um having an entrepreneurial mind yeah. and a supportive environment yes do you think that's the thing that then I leads that to is, that's the, the key to success yeah yeah but they also talk about uh, business being a, a fairly uh, lonely environment mm. you know when you're running a business whether it's just you or a little army of staff that you've got yeah it's still a fairly lonely uh, existence yeah so how, how do you get the support environment in that situation then well i think when it's just you running the portfolio running the, uh, your business then yeah it can be very lonely but i think that if you've got a team around you that you can work with on a day-to-day -day, it makes it more fun i think so um i'm still quite early on my mm -hmm. team's not massive at all there's just a few of us but it's definitely more fun to having someone to bounce ideas from someone to you know help you with the workload so it definitely makes it less you know feels less lonely i guess yeah <laughs> But I do get what you mean because property, some people want to do it all themselves where mm. they want to just buy one a year. They want to refurbish it, do it all themselves. They're not very social with it. They just think, oh, F off. I want to do it on my own. I've even had people say um, that they don't want to do joint ventures because mm. they don't want to share the wealth. Yeah, They want to keep all the profits for themselves. But I think that mentality is kind of backwards Yes, because you can go further with people than you can on your own. Yes, And I think property is a relationship-based game. So I always say this to people, like, focus on building the right relationships, you know, and um, it will take you really far. Yeah, 100%. I completely agree with you. It's it's a little bit like, you know, if, if, you, if you can have all of a small pie. Yeah. Yeah. Or a, a piece of a, a much bigger one. A piece of a, a much bigger pie will generally be way more than all of a small pie. Yeah. And but not everybody gets that. They don't they don't quite get that uh, mindset. Yeah, 100 percent. I've seen it a lot. And I just think I love working with people. I'm quite a social person. So I do like my own space, mm -hmm. but I do enjoy like, that's why I'm doing the joint ventures that I yeah. do. Because I bet some people watching might say, right, how has he got 14 properties when he's only started out with six grand? Yes. I don't think it would have been possible for me to get 14 properties with just that initial pot. Yeah. Um, I've used joint ventures. So I do lots of different joint ventures. I've got several partners, got over over nine partners now Good. um got some really nice people that i work with and we get on well i'd only work with someone that i get on with yes so you know you can't just work with anybody but i think when you do have really good joint venture partners you can grow your portfolio um you know a lot quicker and it's more fun because yes. you're sharing the wealth with someone you're building with someone so yeah but the right relationships are so important. We were just speaking yeah. beforehand off camera. It's, yeah. it's like a, a marriage. You know, you've just met somebody, you shake yeah. hands, I think, great, let's get married. Yeah. So it's making sure that they'd be the, the right person 100%. To, to work with. So somebody that's starting out, yeah. ha, firstly, how do they find uh, someone with money and how do they know they might be the right person for them to work with? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that um, when they're starting out, I don't think they necessarily should look for joint venture partners. I think they're best off saving up money first and buying a very small deal themselves first. So it will take them longer, but I do think that's how that's how I did it. Mm -hmm. um, and it really worked quite well having my own property that was just me. Yes. Um, obviously, I had some investor finance in there, but it wasn't that much. It was only six grand. So something like that where you're actually getting your first one pretty much on your own mm -hmm. and you're you're learning from that and you've got proof in the pudding you've got something to show and say look this is what i've done it's cash flowing it's making money so then when people approach you 
then you can say, right, this is what I've got, this is what I've done. Yes. So it's a bit of a track record. Even if it's just one property, it's still a track record. It's still some experience, isn't it? Yeah. It's shown that you've actually, you've gone through the process rather yeah. than it's all theory. Yeah, exactly. And then when people get later on, so if they've done one, showcase it. And I do think people should go on social media. I think <laughs> lots of people are on social media, but I think it's actually good that people are showcasing what they're doing. I just, yes. the bit I don't like is when people are being fake. Yes. And they're making out that they're doing so much when in reality yes. they're not. And a lot yeah. of people are, are online, but they're not actually sharing any numbers. Yeah. And yeah. I it's find so, that in bizarre. This, in this yeah. environment, it's so easy to create that persona yeah. of everything is fantastic, rosy, yeah. looks amazing, uh, you know, hired supercars, whatever yeah. it might be, to create that image. It's yeah. so easy in this environment, unfortunately. So, what are the things to do you think need to look for to see who, who's who's real and who's just uh uh i guess kind of faking it yeah well i think that you need to look at someone's track record like my number one thing is right what deals have they showcased so like what are the numbers on mm. the deals and like maybe they don't want to share on social media but you can ask them and say look yes. can you send me your prospectus um or just something which shows the numbers because yes. what i do is someone reaches out to me i can send them a prospectus which has got like seven or eight of my, my deals yes. on yes. from start to finish um how much was invested what was the money pulled out on the refinance you know how much was stamp duty it's got a full breakdown so people can actually see what i've done um so i'd say people just need to basically they need to see the numbers um and just don't fall into the trap of believing everything you see online. Yes. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So if somebody's now starting out, let's say in the twenties, yeah. Whether they've say five grand or ten grand, what do you think is the route that they could take? And would that be the same as what you did, or do you think right now the market's different? It'd be a different route or Yeah, so I think there's a load of different ways to get into property investing. But I think that if you can get ownership I'd say people need to be trying to focus on that because then they get the capital appreciation mm -hmm. and they get the cash flow. Um, like my first one I bought, it went up quite a lot um, in a short space of time. Mm -hmm. I bought it for 125 and then obviously I refinanced it at 150 um, a year later. But then two years later after that, I sold it for 158 because okay. um, I wanted to put the capital into other mm -hmm. bigger projects. But it just kind of shows you capital appreciation. Um, and I bet you've got some crazy examples of capital appreciation, which you could share. Yeah. I'm still a baby. I've only been doing it for six years. So I've not really seen capital appreciation, yes. but I understand it. Yeah. And I believe it, you know? Yes. So. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, when, when we put um, time into context. Yeah. Um, so, for example, when my father first came to the country and and the first property uh, he purchased uh, in in the in the sixties uh, at that time, the 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 value of that property then I can't remember the exact numbers uh, now, but it's something tiny. It was like you know thirteen grand or something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers mm. uh, from from memory. But what that property is worth today, it's just it's crazy. Like you know probably like just under 200 grand or something yeah i think how, how is that even possible yeah. if somebody worked and grafted from that time to now they wouldn't have been able to probably earn that kind of uh, money very easily or save that kind of money and still uh, still get by so capital appreciation is definitely one of the the ways to build wealth for the long yeah. term yeah. and uh when um uh you know i i remember one thing's got me interested in property was the uh, the Sunday Times rich list. Mm. When you look at that, how do yeah. people build so much wealth? How's, how's crazy amounts of wealth even possible? Is it just their parents pass it down generation by generation mm. or is it created some other way? Yeah. And it's often, it's businesses or yeah. the sale of businesses that causes you know, huge, um, uh, huge amounts of wealth. And that money is either kept in property or they made it from property exactly. in the first place anyway. Yeah. And that's really what got me in tune with actually there, there's something here yeah and like so when you then start looking at the numbers and you, you think uh it's, it's just unreal what how much wealth you can create through property yeah exactly and that's probably just um you know the way you think is like right that's an opportunity mm. so when you're when you was starting out you'd probably see in the rich list and mm. you're seeing all right property people are making money through property 
your entrepreneur side has thought, okay, cool, well, how can I get involved? Mm. So anyone that's watching this video, they've clearly got the same kind of, you know, interest yeah. in, right, okay, property is the way, how do we make it happen? So, um, but yeah, the capital appreciation, I actually got started because of that interest, mm. because basically my mum purchased the property uh, 25 years ago. Um, it's the property that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. uh, she bought it for 80K mm -hmm. um, with my dad. And basically 25 years later, which is like now, um, it's worth like 350. So, and they did no work to it really. Yes. They've done little bits, but nothing crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And she was always kind of like bragging to me a little yeah. bit when I was a kid, like, yeah. oh, I did this, I did yeah. that. So I was like, hmm, okay. Yeah. Cause when I was young, I was doing, trying everything mm -hmm. to make money. So I definitely like um, got myself in some trouble when I was young. <laughs> um, Cause when I was 12, I was selling, you know, new era hats. They're like um, new era hats. They was quite big and popular at one point, like flat, flat peak hats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I was buying them in bulk from China. I was buying them for like three pounds, 50, selling them for like 15 pound okay. in school on eBay. It's a good profit margin that. Yeah, <laughs> but I was selling loads. Yeah. So like I made like a thousand pound profit when I was 12. But then we got a letter um, to my mum's house from right. their solicitor saying that all the hats were counterfeit. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. then my dad's like called the solicitor. Yeah. And he's like, look, he's 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then he, they were what just- What are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah, like he's 12, like, I'm sorry, but- yeah. And they just dropped it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then obviously I just signed something to say I won't do it. Yes. But I was doing that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I was definitely trying to make something work. Then I tried to do items which were like unbranded. Okay. And like get designs on like belts yeah. and stuff. Yeah. That didn't work. So I've tried a load of stuff, but mm. then I always knew, right, the big money is in property. Mm. So I'm so glad that I um, understood that from quite early. Um, yeah. The entrepreneurial way is lots of ideas yeah. you, you know you've got 50 ideas a day and you think we need to do this we need to start that and we yeah. can build this and uh and often entrepreneurs have done many many things mm. until they've found the one thing that's worked really well yeah for them like for both of us it's been it's been property and what would you say is the way to stay focused mm. because it's very easy to get distracted with constant new opportunities and things especially if that's your where your mindset works yeah 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 well it's interesting we talk about focus because I've recently been diagnosed with ADHD. Okay. So I didn't know this, but I actually struggled to focus on one thing at a time. Mm. So in school, I really struggled. And I was like, and in like the bottom sets on everything. I actually thought I was dumb. So I actually thought I was just like very, you know, slow and I just mm -hmm. wasn't smart. But I always knew, yeah, business is my thing. Mm. I just knew I'm good at this. How comes none of my peers are doing this stuff that I'm doing? And that kind of stayed with me. So I always knew I, I've got my strengths, but it's just not in the written work and the yes. school work. So anyone that's watching, that's, you know, you might be in a similar situation where you're falling behind at school, then don't think you can't be successful. You can 100%. So, um, and sometimes yeah. school has a certain way that they measure how successful somebody is. Yeah. And that success is measured by grades you achieve in yeah. exams. But that's one way of measuring someone's intelligence. Mm. But our schooling system is such that that's the only way they use to measure intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if someone has a ADHD, it doesn't mean they're dumb, they're stupid. Mm. The way they see, perceive and do things is different. Mm. But you're trying to measure their success in a way that actually doesn't suit them or doesn't yeah, fit yeah, naturally yeah. with them. What, what's your thoughts on, on uh, kind of education and the education system generally? Well, I... Um... My thoughts on it is that they don't teach us enough about the things we actually need to know. Mm. So, for example... You mean um, you haven't used calculus in day-to-day -day life? <laughs> no, not at all, <laughs> yeah. Saj, not at all. Yeah. Um, not that I was listening anyway, yeah. but, you know, um, they don't teach us about, you know, how to work with an accountant, mm. how to do a tax return, what is a tax return, how much tax do we have to pay, mm. um, you know, setting up a business, how to do that, how to buy a property, you know, what is a solicitor? Yes. How do we use them? That like, there's so many things that we've <laughs> never almost, been taught. Almost like life skills almost. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And it's kind of like the government's agenda is they want people to be working, you know, just a normal for nine to five mm. job. And it's strange that they don't teach it. It's almost like, right, why is the, their agenda that way? Mm. Why don't they want people to set up businesses? 
because obviously it will help the economy. So I think the government's got their own agenda. Yeah. I'm not even going to get into that too much, but um, yeah. And how do you see the, the, the property market right now? So in the last few years you've been involved, um, there's certain strategies that you're using. Mm. Have you seen that change evolve? Do you think it's going to change or? Yeah. So just for a bit of context, my main strategy is HMO conversions. Mm -hmm. So I'll buy a property, um, convert it into a HMO. Um, typically, we don't do extensions that much. We just typically buy the property, a big, big property, mm -hmm. turn it into a HMO, and then get it refinanced as a HMO for its new value. Yeah. So just uh, to, to add to that, what you're doing is taking a large family house. Yeah reconfiguring the internal space yeah. to have multiple people living there exactly. in, in, in a shared house and you're changing its use so the value is then also changed because yeah. now it's based on the income exactly and some of the properties you know we can get really high income off so when they when they come out to value it they sometimes give us a commercial valuation mm -hmm. so they'll look at how much income is the property producing okay now we believe it's going to be worth and yes. it's much higher Sometimes and that, that number could be way, way higher exactly. than the house next door yeah. that looks the same. Exactly. And a lot of the time it is like a hundred grand higher mm -hmm. than the next door's house. So yeah, it's definitely that's my been my model. Yes. Over the last it's a license years. to print money really, yeah. When you understand how that works. Yeah. Because what the bank is saying to you there, based on how much income you're gonna generate, yeah. we think your asset is worth this. Yeah. So we're prepared to lend you a certain amount of money. Mm. And that's I'm guessing in some cases all the money that you've put into it. Yeah. So you're getting, if not uh, all, most of your cash that you've invested in that project back out. Exactly, exactly. And that's obviously the cream of the crop. You know, yes. that's the thing that we're always shooting for. Um, sometimes we'll buy just for cash flow though. Mm -hmm. So like some of my own deals that I do without doing a joint venture just for myself, I'll just purchase a property just for, because the cash flow is really high. Mm -hmm. So I do do those ones as well. But most of the time we use the BRRR strategy. Um, but just coming so just back. explain what that is in the context of what we're, what we're talking about. Yeah, so that's the buy, refurbish, refinance, rent. Um, yeah. So basically, we're just purchasing a property, converting it into a HMO, um, or you could just convert it into a, a nicer house, um, and then basically renting it out and then refinancing it for its new value, meaning we can pull some money out on the back end. So when the works have been done and we get it valued, the bank will say, right, you bought it for 170 but now we believe it's worth 305 mm -hmm. and you can actually pull a chunk of money back into your bank account your loan amount goes up so your mortgage payments goes up go up but um you've got a massive chunk of money in your mm -hmm. in your bank again so that's typically the strategy i've been doing um but what was the initial question so uh, is that what you're going to carry on doing or do you think things are going to change or um yeah i definitely want to carry on doing that strategy um Obviously, I do lots of joint ventures. I am looking to do more bigger style projects. My biggest project so far is an eight bedroom HMO. Mm -hmm. um, that was close to all money out um, and it went really well. So I want to do more like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the six bed is what I like in a non-article four because we can do volume yeah. purchases because it's, it's so easy to just buy the house, yeah. big house, turn it to a six bed HMO um, under permitted development. Uh, meaning we don't have to apply for planning permission and we can just do loads of them. Effectively, you can just take the property and just crack on because yeah. you don't need to, to apply for planning or wait for any planning. Yeah. Under permitted development, you can just change its use. Exactly. And it feels good providing affordable accommodation yeah. as well. I'll get a lot of flack for that on TikTok and YouTube, people saying you're ruining the housing market and all this stuff, but I'm clearly not. I'm Often actually doing people a that good don't thing. understand that make those kind of comments. Yeah. They don't they haven't really got a clue what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They make a judgment based on three seconds or something they've yeah. seen. So like the working professional HMO rooms I've got typically rent them for around four seventy. Okay. So that's um, including bills, they're paying four seventy for a room in a in a shared yeah. house. Which is affordable to a lot of people. Um and it looks nice. We try and do big rooms. Yeah. We don't normally do en suites. Mm -hmm. um, en suite probably charge around five twenty for mm -hmm. en suite. Mm -hmm. um, but we typically do communal bathrooms. Yes. Um, just because the properties I buy, we don't really want to do an extension mm -hmm. because of you know planning and cost and stuff. So we like to just get a big house that we can conf reconfigure. Um, so there's, mm, most of the time, it's not big enough to do en suite rooms. Yeah. Because I like to keep the rooms nice and big as well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, usually do like 
for a six bed HMO, probably two or three communal bathrooms. Okay. And would you then refinance those uh, as well, the six bed ones? Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. So I've got certain lenders I like to go with and certain valuers I like to go with where I know roughly what we can get the properties valued at. Mm. Um, but going back to your question about the market right now, what do I think of it? I'll be honest with you, it still works, but the interest rates basically means that we're getting temporarily, whilst we're on these high interest rates, less profit per month. Yes. But all it means is we'll just be more picky. Yeah. So being super due diligent with, you know, the per the properties that we're buying. Yeah. And just um, factoring in, you know, when we refinance, it might be on an eight or nine percent rate. Yeah. Does it still stack up? So that's what how I've been so doing the interest it. rates on the loans that you get at exit point yeah. once the project's finished now are much higher, yeah. which means your profit margin's lower. Yeah. Um, what do you think will happen with uh, uh, interest rates? Because I'm guessing when you started, yeah. you've only seen them just climb up and up recently. Yeah, so six years ago, well, over the last six years, my interest rates roughly been about 4% okay. on these HMO deals. These the the loans from uh, the exit point loan? Yeah. Yeah. Exit point loan, 4% interest rate. Mm. So say, for example, on a £280,000 valuation, my monthly payment might have been 750 mm -hmm. just as an example. But now the rates, well, a few months ago, there was like 7.99 mm -hmm. is what I was paying. So that same 280k valuation uh, on the property, the monthly payment would have been 750 based on 4% is now 1400 yeah it's doubled just it's as doubled. the rates doubled your payments have doubled as well yeah exactly um so where, where do you think that's going to go then what do you think is going to happen in the next few years i reckon well my gut i don't know i've got no crystal ball mm -hmm. but my gut feeling is telling me that they might come down a little bit more and then go back up to maybe all mm -hmm. the way to 10 percent, right and then they might come back down but this is just me guessing. Yeah, I do yeah. not know. Yeah, yeah. I'll be honest with you, Sam. I yeah, don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting when when you're starting out, uh, these kind of things don't kind of concern you too much. Yeah. As your business grows, they can have a big impact on your business. Mm. Like the example you've given, where effectively your your monthly payment has jumped from seven fifty to fourteen hundred. It's like pretty much doubled. Yeah. Uh, that can make a big dent on someone's mm. uh, someone's business model. I think the way the market's going at the moment. There may still be an increase uh, that will happen yeah. in um, rates, but I think it'll start to steady. When I first got involved in property, and when we used to try and do calculations, where I was taught is, look, just calculate everything at 6%, 6 regardless, percent, yeah. because that is a fairly standard, when you look historically, rates have mm. sort of been around there. Although there's been points where rates have been way, way higher. Mm. Like, you know, when I was at university, we had the, the guys I was living with in our HMO uh, students, we'd kind of had a bit of a brainwave. Oh, hmm. wonder what our landlord is making in terms of money. All this rent <laughs> we're paying him. It must be a rich uh, git. Let's work yeah. it out. And we we're trying to work it out. With it. We came up with a country. We should buy a house. Yeah, no, for sure. And then we, we kind of went off looking and, you know, we didn't really know anything about property. And also at that time, interest rates were like somewhat crazy, like 12% yeah. or something. Did you uh, go to university in, in Birmingham? Or? Wolverhampton. Wolverhampton, okay. Yeah, and properties, I mean, the house we were living in, at that time, you could probably bought it under 30 grand. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever like look back and just regret saying, "Oh, I didn't buy this one or that one"? Yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't live in regret. I do look back and think, actually, you know, a different decision could have put us in a different yeah. uh, place at that time. Yeah. But then I'm also a big believer that you know we are where we are because of the decision we make each and every day in our life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm a, a big believer that God has a plan for us anyway. So Definitely. you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, yeah, accepting of whatever comes. Same. I'm exactly the same, you know, God's got his plan in his own timing and I just think it's crazy that I'm sitting here now because when I started, I was watching your videos, I was watching a few other people online and on YouTube and I was like, oh, I want to do this, you know, I want to do this. So to say I'm sitting here now is pretty crazy, uh, but I've definitely learned a lot from you, Saj, so thank you. I appreciate you. that. Yeah. You've done amazing well, which is why, and you've got really interesting journey and stuff and I just love the mindset that, you know, um, the someone in their twenties generally doesn't think in this way, yeah. and there's a few people that uh, are pro I'd say most people I speak to in their twenties don't think in that yeah. way. Few do, and uh, sometimes uh, you know the way out of that is you surround yourself with people that are thinking that yeah. way. Now, like we were saying earlier, it can be a lonely business. It's about having a supportive environment. Mm. Well, have a supportive environment, which is one of the reasons I um, I started networking events and I've been running networking for 10 years. Yeah. This is also my way of surrounding myself with other people that think the same way, that want the same thing. Exactly. And you create that environment if it doesn't exist. Yeah, and it's so good. Like, 
your events, the your networking events, the like, the vibe in the room is really positive and it's good and people are they're being real, they're being authentic, but it's just good vibes, mm. you know. So you definitely meet some great people at the event. So yeah, um, can't wait Thank for you. the next one. Thank you. Yeah. In terms of the market now. Yeah. Do you think you'll evolve and change strategy or you think, right, I'm just going to, this is what I'm doing. I'm carrying on doing this for now. Always evolving. Yeah. Like if I look back on my first initial strategy, it's so much different to what it is now. It's still all around HMOs, mm -hmm. but there's always different areas, different purchase price points that we're looking to, to get. Um, I just bought a property for 82 grand um, last week. I just mm -hmm. got the keys for it. I just completed on it. And that was like my cheapest purchase I've ever done so far. So I guess my strategy is mm. kind of kind of changing. That one's going to be a four bedroom HMO. Okay, so still running it as a HMO. Yeah, yeah four yeah. bed HMO. Uh, purchase price eighty two. Refurb probably about twenty k. Um, so small deal. Um, but that will cash flow really well. Yeah, the yeah. cash flow on that one's like one two five zero. Oh, so around twelve hundred pound net profit. Very good. That's because we we've got a uh, provider that's mm -hmm. taking it on. So when you say provider, this is like a social housing? Uh, social housing. So they'll run it for, for social housing. They'll give you a fixed rent. Yeah. So they'll effectively rent to rent it from you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, we're getting 420 per room and they cover all the bills. That's good. My mortgage payment's only around 380. Yeah. So um, yeah, the net profit's like 125 per month. So Yeah. And you've got no kind of headache management stuff to deal with that because they're taking care of it really for yeah. you. Yeah. But let's see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll what? see because uh, I know people have horror stories with different yeah. providers. I'm not a big fan of social housing and yeah. stuff. Yeah, we dipped out Tony a little bit. One of my mentees, she set up a an organisation to to do this, and okay. we 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 set up some properties and gave them to her to run. And I just find it so it's hard work. It's not you can't make it work. Mm. You, you know you can, um, but I just find that actually there's easier ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's easier ways to make money in property. That's it. But we'll uh, see how that one goes because I do have other providers. It's going okay now. At the yes. at the start, it was a little bit rocky because we were struggling to get access to the rooms. Okay. Because the young people that was living in there were just like, "You're not coming in my room." Right. And like, there was nothing they could have really yeah, yeah. done. You know, it was very difficult. We tried to like bribe them. They say yeah. take them to Orton Towers. Yeah. That didn't work. Okay. So yeah, it was a bit difficult. But now we've yeah. managed to uh, work around it. So when it, when you're looking at HMOs, what's the the least number of rooms you would do in a HMO? Four. Four. Yeah. So at four, why why is four the minimal number for you? Because I just like a high profit margin. Yeah. On whatever I do, because I'm looking at each. I actually learned this from you, Saj. Each individual uh, property purchase is like its own individual business. Yeah. So that's how I look at it. When I buy all my different properties, I buy each one pretty much mm -hmm. most of them in a separate SPV. So I set up a new company just to buy each property. Mm -hmm. So it is like its own mini business. Yeah. So obviously when I'm, you know, running that business, I want to make sure my profit is as high as possible. Yes. Um, so yeah. Yeah. The way I, I tend to think about it on a, a four is a minimum I'd look at as well. Yeah. Um, your, your one room is probably going to, um, uh, cover your uh, uh, your operational costs, your gas, electric, water, council tax, mm. and all this management stuff. Two rooms are probably going to cover your mortgage, or if it's if it's a rent to rent, your your monthly rent payment. And the fourth room is actually going to be your your profit. Mm. Um, so you're you're making money on four rooms. On three, I see people sometimes doing three, and I think personally, I think you you can't when you look at it at the end of the year yeah. and think how much money have I made yeah. versus if I just let it to a, a couple or a family or whatever it might have been. Um, you probably haven't really made yeah. any more money and you've had all the headache and hassle. What's the sweet spot in terms of number then um, for you? How many rooms is the uh, ideal? I just like six. Yeah. I like six bed HMOs because then we can do the BRRR strategy. Okay. So that's why I like that type of deal type. We can do it under PD. Yes. If we're doing outside of the Article 4 areas, which we typically are, mm -hmm. I've got quite a lot of deals which are like, very identical in numbers. We're yeah. getting them all valued pretty much the same, roughly around 300K right, right. when they're done. And we're buying yeah. them for about 170. So then you have a model then because before getting into it, you've already worked out, okay, here's my end value, what it's going to be mm. because you know the surveyors and the lenders yeah. on your previous properties, how they value them, they're happy with. You've got a proven model that you're doing that uh, the, the lenders and again, the valuers are happy with. Yeah. So it gives you a degree of certainty when you go into the deal, mm -hmm. that actually what that end picture is going to look like. Exactly. Because even 
we're in the recession right now. Everyone's being a bit doom and gloom about property. Not everyone, but a lot of people. Yes. Um, and even in this market, we're still doing deals right now, which have the likelihood of potentially being all money out mm. or close to being all money yes. out. Um, I've just done one with my partner only left in about 25K, mm -hmm. but it's an eight bed HMO. So right. the return he's getting is really, really good. Yeah, cash flow so, be really good on that yeah. eight bed, yeah. So it's uh, it's definitely doable in this market. And I just think it's a shame Pe there's people out there with money sitting in the bank that are just scared mm. and they don't want to buy in this market because of the high interest rates yeah. and the doom and gloom and stuff. But they're missing out on major opportunities. I'm finding some of the best deals I've ever found right now. Yes, I certainly think now's the now's the time to start buying. Yeah. If you've been sitting on the sidelines and your money is deteriorating in value with inflation anyway, your money is yeah. going to be worth less at the end of the year um, if you're if you're not doing anything with it. Exactly. Uh, the 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 thing about the market being right right now it comes to basic economics of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. There's because of people are fearful there's fewer buyers it just means there's actually more stock around and then people like you and i you know we will find better deals exactly uh, in, in a market like and that's this. what we are doing well are, are you still like buying at the moment such what's your position yeah we're moment? always looking but i'm much more cautious and we're not doing any new developments right now because okay. the way the market is yeah. um so uh one of the things that we are revamping our marketing on is like the lease option stuff mm. which last time we were really doing that as well as like 2009 10 that time that okay. was like flying yeah. then the market changed and that strategy didn't work so well so I, i'm a big believer that you you need to evolve what you're doing mm. with the market yeah you can have a core strategy like hmo service accommodation there are core strategies buy and sell develop a uh, flip they're kind of bread and butter stuff will do but it will kind of go like this there'll be mm. certain times where you focus more on one than the other um but I think the mistake that I made when I started is I just jumped around between lots of different strategies. Mm. Looking back now, the advantage of that was that I built my knowledge up quite quickly because I was trying so many different things. But actually not getting the result was because I was just scattered all over the place. Yeah. I was just focusing on one thing that really that really did help. Mm. So with the stuff that you're doing at the moment, is uh, every day a fantastic day? Do you jump out of bed thinking every day is uh, amazing and loving life or...? you get any challenges thrown in your direction as well well i'm very big on law of attraction okay. so like as soon as i wake up i like to do gratitude so mm -hmm. list in my head all the things i'm thankful for so that really helps my day go yes. well um, and then i just like to drink a load of water and have some coffee go to the gym that helps me as well so every day is good but i do think that there's definitely lots of challenges yeah um, i'm not the kind of guy where i let challenges like really bring me down However, there's been some times throughout my journey where I've been so close to quitting. Mm -hmm. um, probably like two times I can remember where I've just thought, this is not for me. What's led up to those situations? When things go wrong mm -hmm. on a deal or you think things are going wrong. When you look back, you just now with the experience I've got now, I'm just like, oh, you was just overly stressed at that mm -hmm. point because it's a lot of pressure, yes. like money pressure is a different kind of pressure. Mm. Uh, and we're talking millions of pounds at the moment. We don't, we're not talking about 10, 20 grand. Overall, mm. in the grand scheme of things, it's a lot of money. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that like pressure is uh, something that if you can't handle it, then property is not for you. Mm. So that's one thing I would say. I would never want to like push someone to do developments if I knew they wasn't in the best like they didn't have the right mindset for yes. it. You need to have the right mindset for it and be able to take on stress. Some people crumble down, shell up. They can't mm -hmm. handle it. Um, I've even been close to like break point two times where I was just like, oh, I'm, this is not for me. I just yeah. want to give up. But yeah. luckily the people around me stopped me from uh, basically giving up. They just helped me. Yes. Um, they just helped me. And I was lucky to make friends with quite a few developers from my local area. Mm -hmm that um, just gave me a lot of help basically. Yes. And it was massively important. So I think who you're around is so important. I know it's like cliche, everyone mm -hmm. says it, but you know, you're only as good as the five people around you mm -hmm. that you spend the most time with. So I, I fully believe that. So um, I'm very careful who I hang around Yes. and who I choose to spend my time with. Yeah, that, that I definitely agree with the, uh, the five people in your circle, yeah. they will determine what your life looks like. Yeah. And, you know, if they're, uh, uh, let's say, not making the most of things and uh, 
uh, wasting a life, then yeah. your, your environment uh, is going to create the same situation for you. Yeah. Whereas if everyone's driving, pushing yeah. hard, uh, you know, they'll pull everybody up. That's and even it. if you're the weakest out of a bunch of five, mm. the other four will pull you up. Exactly. To, to their level. That's it. And it's nice to have someone to like go to when things are going left because mm -hmm. problems will, will occur. Um, sometimes you might not know, oh, how am I going to solve this issue? Yeah. But someone will know the answer. Yes. And that's why it's good to have that those close people. One of my close friends' portfolio is worth over 140 million. Oh. Uh, he lives very close to me as well. So I was able to meet him quite early on in my journey, yes. make friend, good friends with him. And then uh, my other friend's really big in the rent to rent. He's got mm -hmm. over 400 rooms and stuff. So I'm around these type of people all the time. Yes. That it just makes me feel like I'm always learning whenever we meet up. I'll always pick up on something. Mm. Whereas you might have other friends where you don't learn anything and you feel like you're not really gaining much from it. So, yeah. I'm not saying cut people off, but you might want to distance yourself from certain people when you're not really getting any value from the relationship. Yes. And there's not, uh, in, in property, there is no problem that hasn't already happened before. Yeah, yeah. Someone's yeah. worked it out. It's a yeah. case of who's worked it out that can help. Yeah. And get it, uh, show you how to get it, uh, get it resolved. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, in an environment like uh, property, when people are, are, are driven and constantly pushing uh, forward to do more, and pushing the boundaries of how, how things yeah. are done, there's enormous amount of learning mm. um, uh, in that environment. Yeah. So when people are starting out, how do they get into a new circle of friends, a new environment like that? Mm. How to knock on the door of the guy that's got a hundred million pound portfolio and say, do you want a new friend? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I get what you mean. And I think it's, it's a case of, you know, going to the networking events, meeting people there, going on social media, finding people that's in your city that's doing developments, messaging them, offering people to work for free in exchange yes. for knowledge. One of my really, really close friends, he, that's how I met him. He messaged me saying, can you work for me in exchange for knowledge? Yeah. And we've ended up going on load of like traveled, traveled with him quite a few times and he's a really good friend now. So, you know, it's possible to meet people that way. Yes. Um, and yeah, I just think, get yourself out there. Don't be shy. Uh, my grandma, uh, rest in peace to my grandma, but she used to say, shy people get nothing. Mm. And that always stuck with me. Shy people get nothing. Yes. So that's why I'm never shy. <clears throat> if I it's catch good. myself being shy, I'll just push myself to yes. just go for it. Um, that's really helped me, yeah. Yeah. The uh, Certainly, I think, um, w with networking, when I first started, I was just amazed at how open people were yeah. in, uh, in in property space and they'd answer questions, tell you. One guy that was um, just super helpful when I first started going along to networking events, he'd answer questions for me and i say, you live in the same town as me and I'm looking to do stuff. Why, why would you tell me yeah. all this stuff? And I thought it must be another agenda. And I, it, mm. it didn't quite click for, for quite some time. And look back now and I was thinking, it's just a fairly abundant mindset. Mm. Um, previously, I was involved in a, a, you know, in IT and tech. And, you know, my personal experience was, we didn't share that knowledge with everyone. Mm. If you want my knowledge, you've got to pay for it. Yeah. You know, if you want me to show you how to set up that network and get that server working, you're going to have to pay for it. It ain't going to be a freebie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's how the, uh, the thinking was. Um, but in, in this environment, people, uh, I think people appreciate that there's just so much out there yeah. and we can benefit from learning from each other mm -hmm. rather than trying to just keep a card close to your chest and think it's just it's just about me. And sometimes people say to me, why, why do you share so much stuff and free and online and on YouTube and stuff mm -hmm. as well? I said, look, you know, there's there's plenty out there for everybody. And if you help each other, we all benefit. Like you said, you met somebody, become friends with yeah. uh, uh, as well. And the guy that I was mentioning here earlier that who was quite helpful, I went on to do joint ventures with him afterwards wow. <laughs> as well. That's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because tomorrow morning, well, tomorrow afternoon, one o'clock, I'm having a meeting. Well, we're just going for lunch with two HMO developers that are quite big on social media as well. They both live in Nottingham. We're of similar similar age and we're similar deal type. So we're, yes. we're buying the exact same stock, but we're all just meeting up yes. just to like catch up because we understand the importance of networking and, and bringing you know, your minds together and just uh, helping each other. Yes. So I think it's good to be able to do that. Mm. Some people let their ego get in the way of actually networking and uh, stuff like that and ego can be a massive thing that holds people back mm -hmm. from a lot a lot of stuff they do um i see a lot of young people that are trying to live a flash lifestyle yeah. when they should really be 
saving up to buy their first property. Yes. So stuff like that, that's probably ego driven. They want to yeah. look cool. They want to be that cool guy or, you know, um, they want to appear to be something that they're not. So, but it's the social media generation yes. of comparison. Yes. Um, everyone's yeah. looking on Instagram thinking, oh, I need to be like this. Yes. But my advice to young people would be don't compare yourself to anyone. Just focus on yourself. Yeah, it reminds me of a, a, a meme I remember seeing on social once of uh, four or five of the richest people in the world sitting together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they, they weren't wearing any fancy bling or designer yeah. stuff or anything. And the, 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 the description underneath was the idea is to, to be wealthy, not look wealthy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's crucial to success, I think. And in networking, when we're meeting people, there's many reasons why we might want to network. We might want to network to to meet people like we're talking about that potentially we could learn from friends, uh, a relationship we're developing that way. It could be we're looking for deals. Mm. Um, it could be that we are looking for money. Mm. And one of the things we talked about earlier is, and you mentioned as well, is partnering with other people who've got funds to, to do deals. Mm. And what do you think are some of the... Uh, the, the 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 best ways to to raise money if you like to to find investment if you're if you're kind of starting well Saj I'll be honest with you I think I think people need to be very careful with when they're borrowing funds from anyone um because it's very high risk yes if they're taking on an investment for example a loan agreement and it says they have one year to pay back the money that can land them in some serious problems if they aren't able to pay back that yes. money. And it's almost like I see I see some people that are just taking on too many loan mm. agreements. They're basically leveraged up to their eyeballs. Yes. You know, they're uh, they're taking on too much uh invested debt. And it's like, what is the repayment strategy? Mm. Because um, you know, with the market always changing, there's no guarantee you can refinance that property yes. or sell it. Yeah. Especially if you're doing like a a big HMO conversion, is there that many buyers out there? It's a very limited market. It's a limited market. And it's like, is there many buyers out there in general right now? Mm. So you can't just sell stuff for, yes. for a premium like you might have been able to in the past. So I think you need to be, whenever purchase I'm doing, I'm always thinking, right, can we keep this? If we can't refinance it, can we still just keep it? Yeah. So there's a plan B. There's a there. plan B, yeah. yeah. Um but yeah, I think people to raise finance, just be very, very careful, be cautious, start off small. Maybe, you know, you'd feel better, you'd be able to sleep better at night if you borrowed five grand or six grand yeah. from an investor rather than a hundred grand. Um, so just be very, very careful and just make sure you've got different exit strategies. Make sure you've got favorable terms yes. on the loan agreement if you're doing that. Yes. I think often people talk about the return on investment, what the money they're going to make yeah. and the raising money that way. I think what's more important that is return of investment. Yeah. You know, is, <laughs> yeah. is, is the money safe? Is it going to come no, back? that's it. Yeah, or where, where's it going? What's, what's happening uh, yeah. with it? And I think if you're in a position where, you know, you haven't got the funds to get started, you want to go and raise money. And as you rightly said, rather than just going and borrowing it, there's other ways you can leverage other people's money. So for instance, it may be that you, you know, you find a great deal and, you know, you pull together the team, the people, how it's going to, you're going to turn that deal around, you're going to renovate it, uh, convert it, whatever it may be, um, do the appraisal on it. And now you've got some value there. You found a deal, you've got the people who can do the work, you've pretty much, it's ready to go. Mm. And yeah, you could sell the deal, charge a fee, or you could partner with somebody and say, look, you buy it, you fund it, I'll do everything yeah. and we'll share the profit. That way, you know, they're not lending you the money uh, or anything. You're adding way more value than just selling the deal to them yeah. and you're building up a reoccurring income. Even if you only earn 200 quid or 500 quid a month from that, that's a massive stepping stone. The, you know, when you look at what the average salary is in the, in the country, what people typically earn, you know, a few of those and that's life-changing money for many people. Exactly. Most of the deals I do, they take roughly, you know, nine months or a year to, mm. to, from start to finish. So it's about a year's worth of your initial time and energy. But once they're cash flowing and let out, yes. it can be pretty hands off. Yes. Obviously, there's a lot of management involved in my my side, especially with things like utility bills. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got 14 properties, we're trying to keep track on all of the utility bills. That's a job in itself. Yes. Um, but, you know, there's ways of systemizing mm -hmm. and um, the more properties you get, you can start to build a team and stuff like that. So, yeah. 
I think um, people just be very careful, but just think of different strategies, like you said, the joint venture route, um, or maybe just not taking on massive debts. Just maybe you start small. Yes. That's what I would say to people. Yeah. And also, if people start now, like the route that you followed, I love that, the idea of, look, let's try and buy a home. Yeah. And if someone's willing to to purchase a property, take on a mortgage, yeah. you could probably get 90, 95% mortgage. Yeah. It means you don't have to put a huge amount of money down. Mm. Um, and uh, even if you've got some ability, friends, family to, to kind mm. of chip in a little bit to get you started with that. And if you're if you're living in uh, you know part of the house, you're renting the rooms out. Yeah, you've got income coming in from from yeah. from day one uh, to either pay down money that you've borrowed or build up cash to to get yeah. started. So I think it's a smart way to do it. Yeah, and uh, you know a fairly tax efficient way as well. Yeah, exactly. Because they've got the, as you know the rent a uh, rent, rent a room rooms, scheme, yeah. um, which means you can earn I think is it seven and a half grand. I can't remember what the exact number is. But yeah, there's a certain tax amount. Free. Yes. Yeah, so you can rent. Yeah. Your, so it's like a government incentive. Um, but one thing I've noticed when it comes to tax, a lot of people are scared of property investing mm -hmm. because of the tax implications. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm just going to get have to pay a load of tax. The tax, ta they get stressed out yes. by the thought of paying tax. But the reality is it's so simple and easy once you understand it. Yes. So um, if anyone's watching, they're thinking about getting mm -hmm. involved in property, I'd just say don't be put off by tax. There's so many ways to reduce your tax bills. Yes. Pay zero tax a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, you can run a fairly tax efficient yeah. business, but understanding tax it comes exactly. back to what you said earlier about this is not the kind of stuff to teach you in school. No, people, you know, if they're working for somebody else, they're going to be paying tax anyway. Yeah. They just don't see it. They just see the numbers on their pay slip and then the net number that appears in their bank account. The rest of it's have disappeared in tax. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there's always ways. So Luigi, what's one parting piece of advice you'd like to to give our uh, uh, audience and what's the best way for them to reach out to you as well before we, before we wrap up? Yeah, so parting advice, I would say that focus on yourself. Don't look at social media. Don't compare yourself to anyone. God's timing, you know, everything and everyone is on their own path. So don't look at other people's path and compare your path to their path. You know, just really focus on yourself and try and be the best version of you in all aspects, personal, business, health. Don't just focus on just business, just focus on all aspects. And um, I think you will have more general success. Um, and just try and be successful as a whole. That's what I would say. Great yeah. advice. And people can find me on Instagram, that's LN Capital, um, or YouTube, LN Capital. I try and put lots out on um, TikTok as well, LN Capital. So um, I'm easy to find. Yeah. Excellent. Luigi, thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate thank your time you today. Appreciate Look forward to doing it again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.